church. I want to turn your attention to John chapter 13 and read verses 34 and 35 in your hearing. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you. This is the Lord speaking, of course, that ye also love one another. In other words, he's saying that the way that he has loved us should be the model and how we love each other. Verse 35, by this, what is this? That that he's just given us in verse 34. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if you have love one to another. And I'd like to speak this morning on this subject, love like Jesus. Love like like Jesus. You may be seated and thank you for standing. Coming out of our uh, general conference in Orlando uh, this past week, there was a theme that was throughout the conference, and I want to follow up on that theme and continue in that same vein today. Brother Joel Urshan preached on Tuesday night, powerful message that he titled, The Fruitful Vine the fruitful vine. And he spoke of the need for the church to have the fruit of the Spirit. Many times we focus on the gifts of the Spirit. But he thundered in that auditorium about the need for the church to have the fruit of the Spirit. He said, and I quote, if we will grow in the fruit of the Spirit, then we will flow in the gifts of the Spirit. He talked about how the Bible says afterwards in the book of Acts when the Holy Ghost was poured out, when there was miraculous signs and wonders, it was afterwards. In other words, the Lord spent his time focusing on developing the fruit of the Spirit in the disciples, knowing that afterwards would come the gifts of the Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit are an overflow, as it were, of the fruit of the Spirit. And then he made a profound statement in Revelation that I want to echo again today as we laid the foundation for this message. He said, the seed is in the fruit. The fruit will produce life, sustainable life. Life for the next generation is found in the fruit of the Spirit. And of course, we know that of all the different uh, listings of the fruit of the Spirit in the New Testament, we see that love uh, is the greatest of those. And then on Thursday night, our general superintendent, Brother David Bernard, he followed up with admonishing us as a movement to get a baptism of love. A baptism of love. Three of the main points that he gave us in the vision of the United Pentecostal Church International going forward into these last days. As I contemplated in Scripture how to embrace this mandate, how to begin to love the way God intended for us as Holy Ghost-filled apostolics to love, I begin to look into the Word of God to try to find some guidance and direction. I share that with you now today in this message. In the text that we read of John 13, he said, A new commandment I give unto you. Seems ironic that it would be called a new commandment. It would seem like that this would be one of the cornerstones, but indeed, human nature being as it is, the Lord wanted this principle to be the cornerstone of his ministry, that ye love one another. How do we love one another? As I have loved you. In other words, he's given us an example and a model that we should love each other as he loves us. And then he says in verse 35, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. There are two observations that we can be certain of from this text. One, we are to love others as he loves us. And two, our love for others indicates our love for God. You can't say that you love God and not love each other. Those two things are diametrically opposed to each other. Our love for God is what allows us to love one another. And you have to love everybody, not just the ones that are lovable. Some people are easy to love. Some people are harder to love. But you got to love everyone. Isaiah 25, 4, that great Old Testament 
prophetic book that talks about the Messiah that would come. That great book that I believe the Lord preserved even through the Dead Sea Scrolls, which the majority of Isaiah was preserved through the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And I've heard uh, scholars, Jewish scholars, uh, tell us that it's 99.9% .9 accurate with the King James Version that we have. That book I believe God preserved because it, like no other book in the Old Testament, foretold of the Messiah that would come. And though the Jews may have missed it on the first time, they're not going to miss it on the second time. And so God has preserved that book through uh, nomads and through Bedouins and through Essenes that would hide themselves away and translate scripture and put it on parchment and put it into those clay vessels and hide them in the caves. Uh, a couple of little shepherd boys throwing rocks down into a cave uh, in that particular area on the banks of the Dead Sea heard something crash and went down and f found their way back into those caves where one of their rocks had hit a uh, clay vessel and they begin to realize they had found something valuable. They gave it to the proper authorities and that's how we came upon the Dead Sea Scrolls, one of the greatest discoveries of the 20th century. But I have stood in the museum there in Jerusalem and though we read uh, from left to right in English, you, uh, in, the, in the Hebrew, you read from right to left. And, and as you make your way around there, you see that Isaiah, that great book that said, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. The great book that foretold of Jesus is preserved throughout all of the ages. Oh, hallelujah. Because he's still the Mighty God in Christ. Uh, he's still the Wonderful Counselor. He's still the Everlasting Father. He is both Son and Father. That great book says in chapter 25 and verse 4, as it tells of the upcoming Messiah, for thou hast been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a refuge from the storm. There is something about Jesus Christ and his love for us that is a refuge from the storm. As we have seen demonstrated even over the last couple of weeks uh, as we have attempted through our Hands for Healing ministry to reach out to those that were in that devastated area of Fort Myers in the southwest part of Florida where entire buildings disappeared as that Ian hurricane came across the shore right there. And of course, they were right there in that epicenter, the strike zone as it were. And uh, our, our team has done an amazing job of bringing supplies over sometimes two times a day bringing over pallets and semis and, and all of that. And it's an amazing thing to look around and to see how society reaches out and begins to uh, pull resources together. I don't know if it's because my last name is Myers and it hit four Myers. I'm not sure if that's it, but I've had people contact me I have not heard from in 20 years. Are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm good. I think people think I live in Fort Myers because my last name is Myers. I have people texting me, Brother Anthony Mangan, who I love dearly, but I've never had so much attention from him. He must have texted me three or four times. He called me. Are you okay? Is your family okay? Is your church okay? I said, we're not only okay, we're sending help to the disaster area. I, I think he thinks I live in Fort Myers. That's the only, the only thing I can think of. But I'm amazed at how the, the, the world responds and and, and not just those that are of the fellowship, but people outside and, and everybody comes together. But you know how human nature is. In a couple of weeks, uh, people's attention moves on to other things. But those people are still going to be dealing with, with buildings that were flooded. They're still going to be dealing with having to find a way to get the blue tarp off and to get new shingles on their roof and having a way of finding out how to recover from the disaster. It's not a quick fix. Uh, and I got to thinking about that because the description of Jesus from Isaiah was that he was a a refuge from the storm. And I got to thinking it's possible we can use this storm to illustrate that people are in spiritual storms. I said people are in spiritual storms. People are in emotional storms. People are in relational storms. But oh, we have got a Messiah. We have got a mighty God who is a refuge from the storm. And he is a shadow from the heat. 
when the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall there is a mighty God hallelujah and with his unending unconditional eternal love he provides a shelter from the storms of life and I got to thinking if we can demonstrate love through the way that we serve our fellow man when there's a physical storm that comes what's keeping us as the body of Christ to demonstrate love on a regular basis to not just wait when there's a storm but to give people shelter from the storm on a regular basis this church ought to be a safe place for people to come it ought to be a safe place for backsliders to come it ought to be a safe place for people that need a second chance to come it ought to be a safe place for people to bring their families it ought to be a safe place for people to bring their guests it ought to be a safe place for anybody man woman boy or girl regardless of what the color of your skin your nationality your past your socio-economic level if you're tall or short fat or skinny this is the house of god it's a city of refuge and it ought to be a shadow from the heat because such were some of you, but he has saved us, and it's his love that draws us not. It's his love that draws us not. Our flesh, our own heart, condemns us more than anything. And sometimes when your heart condemns you, you feel like that you should not be a part of the body of Christ. You feel like, and the devil will whisper this in your ear, Oh, you're a hypocrite. You go down there to that church. I know what you've done this week. You got mad at that guy, cut him off. You're going to go down there and lift up your hands down and act like a hypocrite. You better, you're just better off staying at home. And he wants to isolate you. Because even in the savannas of Africa, I've seen the lions and the predators hang in the weeds and wait to see if there's one that's removed from the rest of the herd. One that's limping, one that's wounded, one that's young. And then if he can get them isolated from the rest of the herd, they can pounce on them. Sometimes when you get a wounded spirit, you start to pull back and you isolate yourself from the body of Christ and you become susceptible to the attacks of the enemy. I tell you today, if you ever need church, that's when you ought to go to church the most. Don't be afraid to be around the family of God. I know sometimes we know the Lord has forgiven us, but we don't always know if the church has forgiven us. I pray that the East Wind Pentecostal Church, uh, that when people come in those doors, uh, they could feel the love of brothers and sisters uh, that say, you belong here. This is your house. Uh, this is where we meet uh, to lift up the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, you can't praise God and hate your fellow man. You can't praise God and not love your fellow man. It is a byproduct of our love for him. Jesus demonstrated the following attitudes and how he loved. He had nothing to prove. He had nothing to lose. And he had nothing to hide. I said he had nothing to hide. He went down the streets and people like Zacchaeus, who were hated by his fellow man because he was a tax collector. He was working for the Roman government, collecting taxes from the Jews to fill up the coffers of Rome and this was something that was despised by the Jewish people. They didn't want to be occupied to begin with by the Roman government. But the Roman government had the biggest army in the world. And they took over one nation after another after another. And so they would hire people that were of that particular nation. And they would pay them well to collect taxes from their fellow countrymen. And these people were despised by their fellow countrymen. Zacchaeus was one of those. And he wanted to see Jesus. He'd heard about it. But no doubt he was ashamed. Maybe he didn't want to be seen in public, but he climbed way up in a sycamore tree. He tried to get up in a vantage point where he could see Jesus. But Jesus wouldn't see him. But Jesus walked right down the middle of the street, stopped under that tree, looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come down. Zacchaeus was trying to hide. How many times have we come to the house of the Lord and we just want to hide in the back? Hope nobody's going to pull us out. We don't want to be made a spectacle. Of. We just want to hide. But the love of God stops under your tree. 
The love of God draws you down from your perch. <laughs> and he says to Zacchaeus, we're going to your house today. You came to the Lord's house today, but guess what? The Lord will go home with you. The Lord is telling somebody in this place, I'm glad you came to the house of the Lord today, but Jesus is portable. He'll go home with you. He'll be in your car with you. He'll be on your job with you. He'll go to your place of work. He'll go with you in your school. He's a mighty God, and he will go with you. He's not the kind of God that, and some people even, even the Pharisees sometimes got on to Jesus because of who he was eating with. And the disciples being, you know, more given to peer pressure, they would kind of, you know, play the political card and they would be with some people when it was public and others. But Jesus had nothing to hide. He didn't care who saw it. He was going to be with sinners. Ooh, hallelujah. This is the love of Jesus. Now, I don't pretend today to fully comprehend what the love of Jesus is only to present to you biblical principles. Most people, and I say people now because I'm just talking about humanity in general, most people love based on mutual admiration or mutual attraction. If you admire somebody, but they could care less about you, it's hard to really love somebody like that. There has to be some kind of mutual exchange, as it were. So it's you, you some sort of mutual attraction, mutual admiration, but that type of love has a return. It has a payback. Because we as human beings, we don't want to face rejection. We don't want to be humiliated. And so we're careful and we guard our heart. But Jesus' love was unilateral. It, it, it didn't require a certain response from the recipient. His love was just uh, unilateral. It was just unconditional. It was based on salvation. The Bible said he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The only thing that Jesus got in return for his love for us was a cross, was a crucifixion, a Roman torturing device that eventually takes your life in the middle of a desert. That's what Jesus got for his love for us. But his love for us was not based on anything in return. People say, I don't know about this God. He seems like he's on an ego trip because all of Christianity is about worshiping God. We don't worship God because he needs our worship. He created every tree standing out there in the field. He created every star that you can see and all the ones you can't see. All of nature praises God. He doesn't need your little hallelujah. He doesn't need your little amen. God does not need you or me. But I tell you why I worship God. Because when I lift him up, he begins to move. And I feel his presence. And I feel the joy of the Lord. That is my strength. Woo, I feel it right now. In the name of Jesus. Lord, what is it that can help us to learn to love as you love? I want to follow a pattern that I think will give you five biblical principles from 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We begin in verse 1. Of course, this is Paul writing to the church at Corinth. He says, am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you. For the seal of my apostleship are ye in the Lord. He does something that's is very interesting as you read through the beginning of 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And he begins to make a case that his relationship with God, that that qualified him to be an apostle. At another point, he identifies it as one born out of due season. It is literally defined and how he interacts with his fellow mankind. If it be not an apostle unto others. In other words, what good is it to be an apostle unto God if you're not an apostle unto others? God did not call us to be in some sort of an ivory tower, to crawl up some mountain somewhere and to sit up in an ivory tower and just us commune with God. No, our relationship with God is demonstrated by how we react and respond to others. 
So the first point that I want to give you today on how we can love like Jesus, and I believe this is really important, is an abandonment of rights. An abandonment of rights. As Paul goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 3, mine answer to them that do examine me is this. In other words, when people really ask me why you are an apostle, have we not power to eat and to drink? Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord, and Cephas, or I only, and Barnabas? Have not we power to forbear working? Who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen, or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a hard thing if we shall reap your carnal things? If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. I know those are not easy scriptures to digest, but, but allow me just a moment to make this point. Paul is talking about how that God has given us free will. And we can, uh, with that free moral agents that God has made us to be, that free will, we could say uh, in our own uh, understanding that God is a sovereign God. And whatever is going to happen uh, is going to happen. But Paul said uh, he did not make us a, a free moral agent uh, for us to dismiss ourselves uh, from the process. Uh, but he said this is a work uh, that God has done uh, where we can join together. That's why the Bible said he have chosen by the foolishness of preaching to save the lost. And when you and I say, hey, I've got every right to withdraw myself, but there is something inside of you. I believe it is the Holy Ghost that compels you to keep praying for somebody that has turned you away, to keep loving somebody who has offended you. Never has the Holy Ghost been greater that when you abandon your rights, maybe you have every right to be uh, offended. But I love what one preacher said. I repeat it today. I think it has so much value. I heard one preacher say, he took our wrongs on Calvary, but we must give up our rights in him. He took all of our wrongs, all of our mistakes on Calvary, but we of our own free will, we give up our rights. Yes, in your humanity, you could say, I have a right to be offended. I have a right to be upset with my brother or sister. But I choose not to be. Oh, my friend, there's freedom in that. The flesh would say, well, I can't believe she did that. I can't believe he did that. I can't believe it. And we come to the house of God and we glare across the auditorium at that person. Look at them sitting over there acting all holy. <laughs> Nobody in church knows them like I do. It was said even several times throughout this conference, and I believe it was said even Friday night, that what we should pray for, somebody even quoted Billy Cole, what we should pray for is not revival. We should pray for unity. Because if we can all get unified, revival will come without any hindrance that's why the devil will fight the holy ghost was poured out in acts 2 when they all came together somebody said why did they pray for 10 days i'll tell you why because they had an election first <laughs> i said they had an election first somebody said hey i don't know how matthias got elected Somebody was lobbying for another one. Somebody was lobbying for that. They, the Lord didn't tell them to go to Jerusalem and to have an election. He said to go to Jerusalem and tarry until you be endued with power from on high. But when they got there, being man, being humans, they said, we got to fill this spot that, you know, Judas, he, 
He betrayed the Lord, betrayed us, hung himself. We got to get somebody else. And so we got to check that box. So they did that, but then they had to pray. And after day one, somebody's spirit got a little better. And after day two, somebody else's spirit got a little better. And after day three, somebody else got a little better. Day five, somebody else had to get a little. And I mean, after a while, those that were really hardcore, the really stubborn, hard-headed, you say, oh, pastor, you don't think the disciples were, oh, yes, I do. You ought to read about some of them. I mean, Peter and Paul even went at it. You say, how could that be? Because they're human beings. We're all human beings. We're all subject to the frailty of the flesh. Paul even wrote and put it in the Bible. I went back and withstood Peter because he was to be blamed. <laughs> but at some point, everybody had to say, we just want a move of God. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven. Oh, I don't know about you, my friend, but I want a move of God. I want the Holy Ghost in this place. But all oh, before we get to, to the gifts of the Spirit, we've got to love like he loves. And it can't be based on what we get in return for that love. I've noticed this, as I said in the first service, with this little dog that came into our lives Christmas night last year, Bear. He's a little mini uh, golden doodle. And uh, he has just stolen hearts of everybody in the, in the family there. And, um, but I look at him and I, I see the way I react to him. And I see the way that my wife reacts to him. And I realize there's a big difference. <laughs> because my wife has the ability to just love unconditionally, which must be why she loves me. <laughs> but now, <clears throat> Bear, she is the nurturer. Bear thinks that my wife is his mother because he came to us at only eight weeks old. And when she leaves the room, he runs to the door and stops and cries until she comes back. And, uh, and I love Bear too. Bear is a lot of fun to be with. But I found that I love him more when he listens. I love him more when he obeys. I love him more when he responds and does the trick and the fetch and all of that that I want him to do. But sometimes Bear doesn't do what Bear is supposed to do. And sometimes Bear, being left alone, doesn't get to come to East Wind Pentecostal Church on Sunday morning. So when we get home, he has a little surprise for us. <laughs> He's eaten some important document that was not secure. And I find that in those moments, I love him less. <laughs> After a while, he gives you those puppy dog, you know, eyes and, and uh, you know, you, you, you love him back again. But I realize in my humanity that my love for him is sometimes based upon his performance. There is nothing like in the middle of a night hearing this sound. <laughs> he has some sort of, I don't know, he's eaten some kind of a bone or something he wasn't supposed to. And he's going to get rid of it in the middle of the night. And folks, I'm going to tell you something. You can be dead asleep. But if an animal in your room a cat with a fur ball or a dog with something in his stomach starts going, ah, ah, you will jump straight out of bed. It's the most effective alarm clock known to mankind. <laughs> and you know, you go and take care of it. And fortunately, uh, for me, I have a good wife. I wake her up. The dog is sick. <laughs> <laughs> and, she, and she loves him for being sick I don't understand it I'm like I, what's wrong with his stomach did we get a bad model is he like come from a bad line a bad breed what's the matter with this dog but she loves him even more the sicker he is the more she loves him and I got to thinking thank God 
that God's love for us is not based on our performance. Because we make a lot of mistakes. We, we got this flesh we're dealing with, and sometimes, if we're not careful, we'll begin to think God loves us the way that we love one another. Oh, no, my friend. His love is so much higher and so much greater. It's unilateral. It is unconditional, and I'm thankful for it. And I'm saying, God, I want to be more like you. I want to be like him. And I know it's a lot easier for me to stand up here and preach this than it is to actually live it. But oh, my friend, if all of us could start making some effort to say, Lord, help us to love like Jesus, we have to start with an abandonment of rights. The second thing that we see through this model in 1 Corinthians 9 is an acceptance of responsibility. An acceptance of responsibility. Follow with me now in verse 16. For though I preach the gospel... I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, and this is the verse that just really jumped down at me, I have a reward. If I do this willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, he's saying... I have to minister. Now, this is not talking about preaching the gospel behind a podium. This is talking about being a witness every day, every one of us. And even if I do it willingly, I have a reward. But even if it's against the will, even if it's against the grain of my flesh, I've heard people say, well, I'm just shy. I just don't like to talk. I don't like doing it. Even if you go against the grain of your flesh, there is a dispensation of the gospel committed unto you. You know why? Because you're accepting the responsibility. If I truly love my fellow man, I'll tell him about Jesus Christ. If you truly love your neighbor as yourself, think about how profound that is. If we love our neighbor as ourselves, oh my friend, we can't stay quiet. We got to tell everybody we know. Sometimes we don't witness to our neighbors because we're afraid they're going to come to church and get saved. And then we're going to have to live next door to them. And they're going to be checking up on us. I want him to be saved, but from another neighborhood. Don't y'all act all spiritual like now and act like you never had this thought. But if we truly love one another, there's going to be something to compel us to not just pray in secret for someone to find an opportunity to serve our fellow man. To go over and say, hey, I just want to take this to you and tell you a little bit about what we're doing down at East Wind. I want to invite you to this. I want to bring this. And, and it doesn't always have to be something that you're asking them to do. Sometimes it's just a demonstration of love, of kindness, of long-suffering. I, I, I drove to church here this morning. And as I drove to church this morning, I noticed, I tried not to dwell on it, but I'm a human being. But I noticed that in the cleanup after the hurricane, that one of my neighbors had taken a whole bunch of branches that I guess came from trees in my yard. And he came and piled them all up over in my yard. <laughs> he could have just as easily put it down by the road. Because he's got a whole bunch of yard trash right by the road, by his driveway. But he made a special effort to gather up some and bring them over and drop them in the middle of my yard. So I prayed for him on the way to church this morning. <laughs> Help him, Lord. Number three, acknowledge the role of a servant. Acknowledge the role of a servant. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might 
gain the more. Paul said, hey, I'm free. Yet I've made myself servant unto all that I might gain the more. I don't have to do this, but guess what I'm doing? I'm acknowledging that I have been saved. There's a responsibility that goes with it. I've got to serve my fellow man. I've got to love like Jesus. Though I'd be free, though, and sometimes this is a part of living in an affluent culture like we live in America, where we can all be independent. And we all got automatic garage door openers. And we can all go in our house, never see nobody, never talk to nobody. And we can sustain ourselves and we can live this life and go through it all and never reach out to our fellow man. But guess what, my friend? That is slavery. I said, that's slavery. True freedom is when you get a revelation that I'm going to serve my fellow man, not for what I can get back from it, but I'm going to serve because I'm doing it unto the Lord. I'm doing it unto the Lord. In Romans, it's described as my reasonable service. My reasonable service. Because when you and I begin to serve our fellow man, when we begin to say, we're going to love people, even the ones that aren't lovable, even the ones that irritate us. You know, sometimes I, I volunteer down here with the hands of healing where they put the, the, the boxes of food and cars line up all six lanes deep and all the way down here and around that church and down the road. I mean, it's like 1,500 people a week and hands for healing, they do an amazing job. And people, all we ask them to do is just pop open the trunk. That's all they got to do. And, and volunteers, they put the boxes of food in their trunks. And I'm amazed at these people. They, they, our, our Hands for Healing team and, and Sister Annie, all, the whole team is amazing. And, they just, and people just volunteer. Some of them are from the church, but I'll be honest with you, a lot of them are not even members of East Wind. Don't get me started on this. We don't even have our own church out there. It's people coming from all other denominations. That's going to be a verdict on us, East Wind. And I'll put myself in the category too because I'm not out there every week. But here's the problem. Sometimes in serving people, giving them free food, they get mad. I've, had them, I've heard them yell at people, our volunteers that are with blisters on their hands just loading up the trunk. And they'll yell at them. I've even heard them cuss them out. You're getting free food! You'd think they'd say, thank you. You'd think they'd bring them Christmas gifts. No, they get an attitude. Now, I'll tell you right now, I'll be honest with you. I'm not nearly as spiritual as those volunteers are out there. <laughs> Confession's good for the soul. And I feel it rising up in me. I go over and find Sister Spencer or Sister Dixon, and I'll stand real close to them. And they're like, it's okay, Pastor. It's okay, Pastor. <laughs> Just let it go. Just let it go. And one time, I can't remember who it was that started explaining to it. It may have been Sister Spencer. She said, you know, you get one or two like that, but the vast majority of people are amazing. And I got to thinking, that's the trick of the enemy to put one or two people in your life that's just an irritant. We call them EGRs, extra grace required. <laughs> but the vast majority of people are like, you know what, this has been a blessing to my family. This has been a blessing to our home. This has been a blessing. Don't look at one or two or three and put up a wall around your heart and never realize the value in loving one another and serving your fellow man. What a joy it is to serve. What a joy it is to say, I'm going to love like Jesus. I know I'm a work in progress. I'm not there yet, but I'm going to do my best to try Number four, adjust to the needs of others. Look at verse 20. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews to them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ. Now here he's obviously referencing the Gentiles. That I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak 
that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. Paul said, I'm going to do whatever I have to to adjust to the needs of others because not everybody's the same. Not everybody's coming from the same background. There's people that are dealing with hurts and fears and hang-ups that we have no idea about. But you got to just love like Jesus loved and say, I'm going to adjust whatever I've got to do. i got to win my fellow man. i got to tell him about Jesus. When they brought Jesus, this lady that was caught in adultery, you know what he said to that lady. He said, go and sin no more. Yes, he did say sin no more. Absolutely. He was not discounting or minimizing the sin. He said sin no more. you got to change your lifestyle. you got to move away from this mistake. He was not dismissing the sin. He was not saying that it was acceptable. But here's what he did say. He said go and sin no more. Oh, hallelujah. I'm glad that the first thing he said was go. There's something liberating about go. Be set free. Be released. Go. Don't stay. Don't stop living. Don't stop being productive. Don't stop thinking that God doesn't have a call for your life. He said, don't sin anymore. Yes, but go. That's why he said you got to speak the truth in love. Yes, doctrine is important. Yes, it's important to know the plan of salvation. But I'm glad that it's woven with the mercy of God. That God can tell you and I that we can be set free. You ever notice how people at stoplights are in a bad mood because they had to stop? Yeah, I noticed it driving to church today. When you leave here, I want you to look at people that you're stopped with next to the stop sign. People are not happy about having to stop. They get on their phone, they do something else to try to get their, their time redeemed. But when the light turns green, it's like a party. It's like somebody has busted the pinata. There's all kinds of activity and happiness, and people are on the accelerator, and they're smiling and waving, and they're all excited. Go! Don't sin anymore is the red light, but go is the green light. Hey! You're going to serve God. There's going to be red lights and green lights. You can't live with all green light, no red light. You can't live with all red light, no green light. But I'm glad that the Lord said go. Your identity is not going to be the mistake of your past. I'm telling you, go. You've got a future. You've got hope. You've got life. You've got the love of God. Woo! Stand to your feet. I'm all done. Number five, anticipate the reward. Paul said, know you not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run. You can run because he said go. Run that you may obtain. There's a prize. There's a joy that comes to living a life of freedom, a life of saying, I'm going to love others. They don't have to do anything in return for me to love them. I'm going to just love them because Christ loved me. How many in this building could be honest today and say you didn't deserve the love of God, but he loved you anyhow? How do you respond? How do you repay? A God that has everything. Heaven is his throne. Earth is his footstool. He sits on the circle of the earth. How do you repay? We'll tell you how you do it. You love your fellow man. That's why he said, love your neighbor as yourself. Because in so doing, you demonstrate your love for God's word. You can be honest this morning and say, Pastor, I need more of that love in my life. I want you to step out where you're standing and come down to this altar. You just be honest enough, just say, here I am. I I know it's in the Bible, but I'm human and I, I don't always respond correctly. I let things get in my spirit, but I'm willing to release it all today at this altar. You just step out of where you're at and come to this altar. Here's what I want us to do this morning. I felt this in the Holy Ghost this morning, our first service. 
I don't want anybody standing at this altar by themselves. I want somebody to come and stand with you. And I want all of us to be grouped up with at least two people. Nobody by yourself, but people that will stand together with you and say, hey, you're not going to have to bear your burdens by yourself. I want you to know you got a brother. I want you to know you got a sister. Come on, if you come down as a married couple, that's awesome. But if you come as a man, find another brother. If you're a lady, find a sister. Come on, stand next to him right now. Let's pray for one another right now in the Holy Ghost. Yes, Lord. Thank you for the body of Christ. Thank you, Lord, you didn't give up on us. We're a work in progress, oh Lord.
the grave. 